So welcome everyone to our second Wild About Wildlife series, Preventing Wildlife Damage on Your Property. So as we wait for everyone to join, I'll introduce myself. My name is Peyton Homiak and I am the Environmental Coordinator for Community Strategy and Engagement with the City of St. Albert. And I will be the moderator slash IT person for this uh, evening's webinar. And uh, without reminder, uh, that your audio and video will be muted for the duration of this webinar. Uh, we've received a couple questions in advance, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A function, um, and we'll do our best to address those questions at the end of the presentation. And before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items. Uh, because this webinar is video recorded, uh, the session will be made available for viewing on the City of St. Albert's and Sturgeon County's public website. And there, they will include the full visual, visual and audio recording of all presenters and any of the presentations. And if you have any questions regarding the collection of your personal information in attending this webinar, please contact our city, the city of St. Albert's Fort Coordinator at voip at stalbert.ca or call 418-6663. And uh, the presentation will take about 35 to 45 minutes and we'll try our best to leave uh, 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so with that, I will now pass it off to Angela Veenstra, who will introduce our guest presenter. So take it, yeah, Angela. Oh, and she's not here, okay. Um, give us a second. I think she's gonna join back. She's a presenter. Sorry, Peyton, she had messaged that her, uh... She's having technical difficulties. Okay. okay, hold up one second. I think I can probably get up that. So I guess, Bill, if you would like to introduce yourself, now is your cue. And I will get the, uh, I'll try to get this PowerPoint presentation done on my end here. Okay. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, attending uh, our webinar, and I hope that you find it interesting and informative. Um, so my experience is uh, as a professional trapper, as a wildlife professional, um, wilderness guide. Uh, I've been doing that for about 40 years. Um, currently, I am president and senior consulting lead for animal damage control a company that my sons and I have been operating for 30 years now. And basically we provide um, consulting, training and management uh, for all levels of government, for industry um, and for residents and uh, uh, across Alberta and uh, Western Canada. So we have a pretty extensive uh, experience and dealing with wildlife and particularly urban wildlife in and around residential communities, both in uh, urban towns and cities and in uh, rural acreages and subdivisions, that sort of thing. And that's going to be the focus of our um, information uh, discussion this evening is uh, what's the best way, uh, what, well, what can we, what can we uh, expect to encounter in terms of some of the more pesky critters uh, in and around residential communities? And uh, also, um, what are some strategies that we can use uh, to help avoid conflict uh, with these different species? <clears throat> and I'll... Um, I'll start off with a, maybe a few do's and don'ts uh, regarding uh, wildlife that you might uh, see or encounter in and around uh, your uh, house and yard and your acreage. Number one, under any circumstances, uh, you should never, ever feed wildlife uh, and attempt, certainly uh, not purposely and even... Um, uh, mistakenly or inadvertently providing food sources for wild animals. I know it's nice uh, to feel that you have that kind of connection and interaction, 
<clears throat> but I, but my experience is, and I know it sounds a little brutal, but that a fed animal is a dead animal. <clears throat> and uh, people just don't understand the uh, consequences of um, what uh, might uh, transpire, uh, even from simple things as a bird feeder or, uh, you know, a fruit tree or something like that. Um, so uh, uh, under no circumstances uh, should we be uh, looking at uh, feeding any animals at all. Um, <clears throat> I know bird feeders, um, people love them. They are wonderful to have and attract birds to your yard. What I would ask is this. I mean, if you're an avid bird fan, restrict your feeding to the summer, to the summer months. I mean, to the winter months, do not feed birds uh, during the summertime. And uh, we, you will, uh, just by that simple step, reduce uh, uh, conflict with other species that are attracted to uh, bird feeders. Um, other than just the birds that you want to try to attract there. Um, the second thing is that um, twice a year in the spring and in the fall, do a really thorough inspection of your house and of the area around your yard. And uh, I'll, I'll touch in detail on some of those things, but um, uh, contractors and builders build houses now and they do not build them with the idea of excluding uh, wildlife who are trying to encroach into that structure. And so um, uh, a, a thorough inspection of the entire house, including an attic, uh, uh, make sure that all vents, uh, including attic vents, dryer vents, fan vents are screened to prevent birds and rodents from gaining access. Make sure, and you can do this with a big stick even, push up on all the soffits underneath the eaves of your house and make sure there, are, there is nothing loose there because animals like squirrels and raccoons, um, if they're attracted to your yard, will test every single panel of your soffits um, underneath the eaves of your house. And if there's anything loose there, they will push up and use that as an entry point into the house. Um, and uh, I'm just going to start into the visual part of the uh, presentation now and talk about our first species, which uh, are we going to get that up there? Ah, yes, Mr. Porcupine. And uh, as uh, everyone knows, uh, uh, porcupines are very common in and around uh, all of Alberta, but particularly uh, around areas of human habitation. Um, they uh, not only pose a threat to dogs or are people who are unthinking enough to go to try to kick a porcupine and move it on its way, um, that uh, yeah, they do carry quills for self-defense and they uh, can lead to some big vet bills if uh, your dog uh, encounters one and tries to uh, smell or bite it. They also can cause significant uh, damage uh, to uh, fruit trees uh, and um, coniferous trees. And um, they do that by uh, girdling the trunk and uh, the branches uh, of those trees. Uh, okay, let me just pop to the next slide here. And um, yeah, uh, pine trees are the most susceptible uh, to porcupine uh, damage simply because they're very, very uh, um, attracted to the, to the, to the uh, turpentine and the bark and the pulp uh, of the pine tree, but also fruit trees as well, particularly apple trees. Um, and so um, uh, one wants to make sure that if you have pine trees and porcupines in the area, it might be a good idea 
uh, to uh, wrap uh, the uh, trunk um, with uh, something slippery, like uh, 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 flexible uh, plastic. Uh, one thing that works very well is stovepipe, and that comes in sections and is easy to uh, uh, expand or contract. You can just add sections and one length of stovepipe uh, on a um, on a tree will save the porcupines from being able to climb up there and girdle and damage and kill that tree. Uh, the other thing is this, and that goes not just for porcupines, but uh, for all kinds of uh, pest species, species and including predators, if you have apple trees, please, when the apples are ripe and they fall to the ground, make sure that you pick up and uh, remove all of those apples because you're going to attract every animal in the area, including deer, coyotes, other predators, and every kind of rodent manageable to those, um, to those uh, trees. If uh, you want to attempt to trap a porcupine, a large cage, tra cage trap works very well. Uh, the best bait to use for porcupines to lure them uh, into a cage trap is um, uh, fresh cut apples uh, topped with uh, rolled oats and a generous sprinkling of pickling salt. And uh, if you uh, use that as bait uh, in the back of that cage, uh, you will catch uh, uh, any porcupine that comes into your yard or that's up in a tree. Um, I suggest a live trap, uh, trying to get a porcupine into a uh, garbage can requires some experience and the results can be painful if you make a mistake there. And we'll go to the next one. Here's another pesky little critter. Often, often mistaken uh, uh, as a mole. Uh, this is the northern pocket gopher. And they're very common anywhere where you have either a thick grass layer or um, uh, uh, vegetables, uh, something that uh, has uh, perennial uh, grasses or um, <clears throat> around agricultural areas where you have volunteer alfalfa, that sort of thing, but even in the front lawn. Um, habitation is immediately uh, recognizable by the mound of black earth that appears on uh, above ground that seems to have no uh, hole uh, on the surface. And that's because uh, the pocket gophers uh, live in a network of tunnels uh, just under the root layer of grasses and in gardens and that sort of thing. Uh, the amount of damage that they can do if they um, are allowed to uh, propagate on one's property is extensive. And I've seen, I've seen it so bad that literally uh, it almost becomes impossible to mow the lawn, uh, uh, particularly with a uh, ride, ride mower because of the damage that's uh, done to the subsurface of that lawn and you just are cave in after tunnel after tunnel. So uh, when you first see the mound go up, uh, it is, uh, <clears throat> that is the time to catch and uh, remove uh, the uh, pocket gopher. The only, the only reliable method to do it is trapping. Uh, and I suggest, uh, that uh, either you look on the internet and figure out how to do it or hire a professional because there's uh, about a hundred wrong ways to do it and just a few right ways to be uh, productive and effective in removing pocket gophers. And we'll go to the next side. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, um, not only damage uh, to uh, park areas, but also um, gardens as well, particularly vegetable gardens. They can be very destructive there. So keep an eye open on any changes on the surface of your lawn uh, and respond accordingly. The next one is deer mice. And uh, this is a species of mouse that we have to pay um, uh, particular attention to because they are also known carriers of uh, hantavirus, 
which uh, can be a very serious uh, um, disease. Uh, and so uh, we want to make sure that we do not have deer mice breeding uh, either uh, in our house and structure or garage or barn or shed or, or wherever they might be found. Um, the, uh, the best way to um, locate or determine you have a, a mouse problem, look along the, along the walls uh, of uh, your house and uh, particularly in uh, cupboards down at ground level uh, or in uh, walkways or anything that might uh, be um, uh, have access, even if it's intermittent access uh, to the outside. Um, mice can go readily from an attached garage that might have the door open a lot right up the inside of a wall. They will chew through drywall. And uh, if it's an attached garage, they'll go right through the attic and wind up in, in the house. So um, my advice with deer mice or any kind of mouse is that um, we um, <clears throat> do a very thorough check um, of uh, the interior of the structure, but also the outside. Check along the edge of your foundation for any kind of small round holes about an inch wide going down along the foundation, any kind of droppings, um, anything like that. And if you see anything that looks like it might, might be a mouse dropping, initiate um, trapping immediately. Trapping is much more effective than poison is. I don't recommend uh, the use of poisons uh, for any kind of wildlife control uh, because it leads to not only secondary poisoning, but also herd tolerance in terms of uh, uh, animals getting very, very low doses and then becoming immune to the effects of poisons like uh, warfarin and other anticoagulants. So trapping is the very best. Uh, do not buy any other mouse trap except the Victor with the yellow tab that's kind of uh, shaped like a flat piece of cheese. The reason that that is effective uh, is that uh, um, the, uh, the uh, trigger tab end should be put right against the wall when you're trapping, but just a little bit of bait on it, a little bit of peanut butter, uh, when you come to when you're baiting any animal into a trap, less is best as far as the amount of bait that you use, and you'll find that that's very very effective. The other thing is make sure that um, uh, the uh, bottom of your garage doors are sealing properly with the barrier. Uh, the same with weather stripping. All of those things on any entryways uh, in and out of structures. Uh, mice will exploit all of that. When the first snows come around, go around the house and look for tracks. And if you uh, see any kind of a hole going down along the foundation, it may be, especially with an older house, it may be that you have uh, a gap or a crack either in the foundation cap that the house is built on, or you have a crack further underground. Uh, the heat loss from that will attract rodents. It's like uh, putting out a great big flashing neon vacancy sign for any kind of uh, wild rodent. So uh, those are all good strategies for the prevention and control of mice. And uh, our next slide here, muskrats. Uh, somewhat, somewhat common in around uh, park areas, uh, uh, in uh, towns and cities, um, in stormwater ponds, they can be uh, quite prolific. Uh, and certainly if you're living uh, in a rural uh, county um, or an acreage with any kind of water body around, um, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, with particularly if there's uh, cattails in that water body, uh, it will certainly, and it has any kind of depth of water over a meter, you're going to attract muskrats in there. I'll, I'll issue one um, word of caution with muskrats. Quite often, they find themselves estranged from the habitat they're in, whether it's frozen out or due to construction or something, you'll see them wandering around um, nowhere near uh, water. They are to be avoided. Don't let your dog or anybody else go and 
uh, confront the muskrat. They are aggressive, like many rodents are, and they have a very nasty bite to them. So make sure you avoid any kind of contact with live muskrat. Um, the rest, uh, the damage that you see from uh, muskrats is twofold. Number one, the vegetation eat out of a pond uh, that might be sorting other, uh, 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 um, ha have other uh, species in there. Things like fish ponds like that. Uh, it can change uh, uh, the uh, uh, clarity uh, and uh, create more siltration in the water, make it uninhabitable uh, for fish. And of course, there is the tunneling into the bank year round, which can have a catastrophic effect in terms of the uh, integrity of the bank of that, um, of that uh, water body. Muskrats are not considered a pest species. They are actually a wild fur bear. And so uh, in Alberta, uh, you require either uh, the services of a licensed trapper or a damage control permit from uh, uh, the Provincial Fish and Wildlife Office in order to trap muskrats. Um, they're a little trickier to catch than uh, one might think. And uh, an animal like uh, muskrats is best uh, left uh, uh, to the services of, of a uh, professional to deal with. Okay, this is a high... Uh, uh, conflict species, particularly around any acreages, and certainly St. Albert has one of the highest red squirrel populations I have ever seen. Um, we have quite a few pre-submitted questions regarding red squirrels, and so I'll do a brief overview here, and then um, uh, I'll, I'll get to those questions. So Red squirrels are active all year round and um, uh, they're very territorial and uh, they're very, very comfortable uh, in close proximity to people. Uh, in particular, uh, they will be attracted to uh, habitats that have mature coniferous spruce and pine trees, simply because the cones are a major food source, but also uh, provide summer nesting habitat for red squirrels when they're breeding. Uh, they can uh, exist in just pairs and small families, but uh, in, uh, in a uh, mature or long-standing habitation, uh, what will develop is what are called a squirrel midden, and it can uh, either be underground, which is a traditional habitat for squirrels, uh, in a natural habitat, they, um, they spend the entire winter underground, not in the tree. And so if you uh, see a mature uh, grove of spruce trees uh, with a heavy, heavy uh, overburden of needles, you'll see, and you see a lot of holes dug in there, those will be the winter dens and storage holes for squirrels. Now, the downside of squirrels is that they find... Uh, human residences and structures, particularly attics and walls, very, very attractive for uh, storing their winter food supply, which they spend the entire uh, summer gathering. Um, and so, again, when it comes down to the inspection process, twice a year, either you or have a professional inspect your attic, check uh, for uh, any kind of chewing or holes in your house, even if you're not hearing the squirrels, uh, they still might be there. Um, make sure that your yard is clean and that um, you don't have any excess uh, vegetation uh, or food out there that will attract more squirrels uh, than normally might be around the area because they will use dead and dying vegetation um, for bedding and nesting material, along with anything else they can chew their way into, like uh, lawn furniture and uh, cushions, any any anything that um, you know has fiber fill or any kind of insulation. If you start seeing uh, uh, 
the insulation from your house up in a nest in a tree, you'll know that you probably have a problem. Um, in terms of squirrel management, um, generally when we look at uh, uh, squirrel encroachment in the houses, yes, uh, the storing of food in there is, uh, can affect uh, the insulation in the attic. Uh, squirrels also tend to rake up insulation and use it for nesting materials and will and will nest and breed in houses and uh, that is uh, when uh, their activity there can become highly hazardous uh, because uh, if they nest or uh, forage in and around uh, uh, wiring in the attic or in the walls of the house uh, they might be prone to chewing that and that can create a short and subsequent fire. Um, also, uh, uh, squirrels can also chew, uh, pe uh, uh PEX, uh, plumbing lines, um, all kinds of things. So, um, really, uh, uh, any, any, uh, noise or in perceived encroachment into a house should be investigated immediately. Remember this one thing too is that you knowingly know that you have squirrels uh, or any other rodent or animal in your house and you do nothing and uh, uh, a fire or other damage uh, results of that and the insurance company gets word that you knew about that, they will void your policy. So if you read your home policy, you will see that clause in many of those policies. So it really does pay to be on top of that. In terms of dealing with the squirrels, um, <clears throat> trapping uh, is, uh, is uh, a very good way uh, to remove squirrels, whether you use live traps or lethal traps. Uh, the uh, rat traps that you buy in a store work very well on squirrels as well. Just make sure that you set them, set them in a, in a uh, covered area so that you're not killing birds uh, uh, in your efforts to try and catch a squirrel. Uh, the uh, cage traps, if you do set them for squirrels, they like any other live trap, they need to be checked on a daily basis and with squirrels almost two or three times a day. Um, any animal that's uh, being held uh, in a cage trap uh, is under a lot of stress and uh, squirrels will die after just a couple of hours of being in a trap. Once uh, the squirrels are removed, either by you or a professional, you must seal up your house to avoid more squirrels re-entering. Remember, they've got a, probably an entire winter's food supply in that house. And if that is not cleaned up and the entry points to the house sealed up, then um, yeah, you're just gonna invite more squirrels into, uh, into, that, uh, into that structure. Uh, one last thing that was uh, raised was squirrels storing uh, food and entering into uh, vehicles that are parked outside. Uh, and the only thing that uh, I've seen to be effective in uh, deterring squirrels is those uh, ultrasonic uh, pest devices that uh, uh, you plug into an electric outlet or into an extension cord. And if you uh, put that underneath your car, uh, when uh, you're not driving it and it's parked, if you have lots of squirrels around, they, I, I, I'm not sure if they're a hundred percent, but they do provide a pretty effective deterrent. Um, those ultrasonic devices in time inside a structure sometimes work for mice. I've never seen very much success, uh, with squirrels, but under a vehicle, uh, I think because it's much closer quarters, they seem to uh, they seem to uh, not like them very much. So um, that's uh, about all I have on red squirrels, and uh, we'll go to a different kind of squirrel. I'm actually becoming uh, more common in some of the smaller uh, towns and even cities is uh, the ground squirrel, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, they are very prolific. Uh, they uh, do hibernate. Uh, the males uh, will start hibernation in August 
and come up early in March, uh, often on top of the snow. And uh, the females uh, will not go down and, and until uh, frost starts going into the ground. They do prefer pasture and short grass uh, uh, park, uh, parks uh, and also disturbed ground areas. And uh, the uh, tunneling and the consumption of uh, vegetation are the major issues with ground squirrels. And uh, uh, they can grow in population very, very quickly. And they are characterized by quite a large dirt mound with an associated hole two to three inches in diameter. Um, <clears throat> they can be hard to deal with in a city. Uh, in order to, to remove ground squirrels, uh, they do not readily go into live traps. Uh, generally, you are looking at lethal control and uh, quite often there are bylaws associated with uh, the use of lethal traps in a lot of municipal areas. So I suggest uh, that you contact a uh, professional to deal with any ground squirrels. Um, there is information uh, readily available on uh, the internet. My Wild Alberta is not bad. The Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management, hosted by the University of Nebraska, is an outstanding resource for anybody who wants information on any kind of wildlife conflict. And I highly recommend that website for everyone regarding any kind of conflict species. Um, and we'll move on here. Vol. Uh, this is... Uh, a rodent that um, uh, it kind of goes in cycles. Uh, when the uh, deer mice, I think they're they're competitors with the other mice, particularly deer mice. And so uh, when the when the when the mouse cycle is kind of down and the population uh, is at a low ebb, you'll see a lot of red back, mostly red back, but also meadow voles. Um, in uh, urban uh, areas uh, and residential areas, especially if they're, they're around uh, uh, parks or um, stormwater ponds or natural areas. Voles are more of a woodland animal, but they will readily uh, encroach into residential property. Um, their main uh, issue is the damage they do to vegetations and on lawns not during the summertime, um, voles uh, live under the snow layer right against the ground uh, in the winter and they uh, will create an entire network of trails, uh, both from travel and from consumption of uh, grasses underneath the snow. And so um, if uh, you want to uh, prevent uh, damage uh, on lawns and in gardens uh, from voles uh, overwintering on the lawn or uh, causing damage during the summertime, here's the best thing you can do. Number one, in the fall, the last time you cut your lawn, cut it absolutely as short as possible to reduce the height of the grass because that uh, uh, warm, frost-free layer between the snow where it's hung up on higher grass and the ground is uh, what provides the habitat for voles. Also, in your garden and around your trees and ornamentals, remove any dead vegetation uh, or uh, um, dying annuals uh, and just leave the perennials there, but any dead or dying annual vegetation, remove all of that. Then when the first snowfall comes and you get an accumulation of about three to four inches, if you uh, take a two by four uh, or something similar and a tap a roach, uh, a rope at each end and pull it lengthwise around on the lawn and disturb and compress, all of that snow on your front and backyard, you will literally eliminate the habitat that voles require in order to survive the winter on lawns. Because as soon as snow is disturbed, 
it changes structure and it firms up and bonds to the ground. There will be no more habitat for voles there. So that's the best tip that I can give you as far as uh, deterring uh, vole habitation on uh, residential property. Okay. Here's uh, one and uh, back in the day, uh, you know, a badger is something that you would only see, um, you know, out on farms and ranches uh, and that sort of thing. But with the increase uh, of the uh, presence of burrowing rodents, um, it attracts predators like the badger. And uh, the damage uh, that can be caused by badgers is twofold. Number one, uh, the holes uh, that they uh, dig in the ground either to live in and breed in are extensive and unbelievably complex. Um, and uh, uh, also a badger is a large weasel, a voracious predator and in urban populated areas can be a threat to pets, livestock, and public safety. So it is uh, an animal that uh, if encountered or sighted uh, needs uh, professional intervention immediately. Do not attempt to scare or uh, uh, bluff or put off a badger. Um, it's about 50-50 with them. You might scare them away and there's just as good a chance that you're going to bring on an attack. And uh, uh, a badger is an animal that you do not want chewing on you uh, or your pets. So um, uh, badgers are a serious uh, animal. Um, and uh, the best way to control uh, badger habitation is to actually control the rodents on your property. If there's no pocket gophers and no ground squirrels, you will have no badgers. Uh, so this in particular uh, for acreage owners in uh, rural municipalities. Okay, red fox. Red fox uh, is an animal that is very, very comfortable uh, in close habitation uh, to uh, residential areas and to human beings. Uh, main reason for that is the major predator of the red fox uh, in, uh, in uh, rural areas is actually the coyote. And uh, coyotes uh, will uh, dig up uh, fox dens and kill pups and will chase down and try and kill a fox if they can catch them. Uh, so foxes love to den under sheds and decks and steps and uh, right, in a, right in an occupied yard. Uh, they're not worried about uh, dogs very much. Um, and uh, the uh, issues associated with fox habitation, they might seem really cute and they are fascinating to watch their antics up close, uh, particularly when the pups are out and, out and about. Two things you have to know though. Uh, number one, um, they are... Uh, a very, very aggressive, efficient predator. Um, cats, domestic cats, are one of their favorite prey species. So if you have cats, really you don't want foxes anywhere around you. Uh, any kind of birds that uh, you're attracting are uh, to the area. Foxes are master bird hunters and they'll annihilate um, the uh, songbirds uh, in and around your yard. Um, the only benefit is that, of course, they're also master uh, hunters of rodents. So if, uh, if you're not uh, having an issue with them, you don't have cats, you're not worried about predation on birds, they will certainly clean up on any rodents, uh, including mice, ground squirrels, pocket gophers, pretty much everything. Uh, but they, um, they are an animal to be aware of. Uh, and... Uh, uh, physically, uh, they almost have the same physical capability as a cat. They can climb an eight foot high uh, chain link fence uh, uh, like a cat, or they can literally jump up and over it. They're tremendously agile. So, um, you know, a normal fence uh, 
in a yard is not a deterrent for red foxes. Um, so just be aware of what of uh, what uh, you're exposing yourself to if you have foxes uh, um, on your property. Uh, the last thing too is uh, if you're allow allowing them to den close and your pets uh, are having any uh, interaction with them, uh, a the fox is a walking flea host. Uh, there is no animal that carries more fleas than a red fox. And so if you have them on your property, guaranteed that uh, the fleas from the foxes will be jumping all over your pets as well. Uh, so that's something else to keep in mind. Okay, we'll move on there. Raccoons. <clears throat> so, uh, Raccoons uh, historically have always kind of been around the greater Edmonton area, uh, you know, with just the odd one here and there. And over the past five years, uh, we have seen a real influx in the number of raccoons in the area and particularly habitation in and around the Sturgeon River in both St. Albert and in Sturgeon County. The reason for that is that the Sturgeon River has very, very high numbers of both freshwater crayfish and freshwater clams, which uh, uh, would attract uh, the raccoons into that area. Um, but also, um, we now have a lot more urban uh, uh, development around that Sturgeon area uh, watershed and raccoons being uh, the animal that they are, um, are attracted to human habitation and will exploit any and all food sources associated uh, with, uh, with uh, residential areas. Number one attractant for raccoons is bird feeders. You have to know that. The reason I said, uh, particularly in uh, St. Albert and Sturgeon County, if you have to fear, feed uh, birds, do it in the wintertime when they really need it, because uh, once the cold weather hits, raccoons are pretty much inactive uh, most of the winter. And so you'll, uh, you'll avoid uh, attracting raccoons uh, to the area during winter months, but just make sure you clean it all up uh, in the summertime. Raccoons, if they get into a structure, can cause a tremendous amount of damage. They are catastrophic to have them living and breeding in an attic. Uh, almost exclusively, they will enter uh, either through a large vent that is not screened, but their favorite is to uh, get up on the roof of a building and test every single soffit underneath the eaves. And if they find one that they can push up, they'll be in there. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it uh, can be a real uh, test to, to get them out of there once they've found their way back into a structure. Uh, remember this, raccoons are also very aggressive predators. They're omnivores, they eat uh, 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 plant and uh, uh, animals. Uh, so the, they do prey on uh, uh, birds and uh, certainly uh, poultry, uh, domestic poultry um, and uh, uh, birds and uh, all kinds of things. So literally anything they can get their teeth into, uh, they will consume. Remember this also is that I do not think there is a wild animal that carries more viruses, bacterial in infestations and parasites than a raccoon does. So one of the hazards of raccoon habitation is that um, there is uh, very serious uh, viral and bacterial contamination from their uh, uh, feces and droppings in and around uh, areas of habitation. Uh, so um, if you do encounter uh, what uh, you think uh, is raccoon feces, it should be sprayed down with bleach and then uh, picked up uh, just using uh, a uh, bag the same way you would uh, for your pet and disposed of uh, immediately. Uh, 
having pets exposed to that is, yeah, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, another uh, animal is the striped skunk, like raccoons, very, very comfortable and close uh, to uh, human habitation. They will uh, exploit uh, steps that uh, they can gain access to. They'll dig under uh, walks, sheds, uh, especially garden sheds are a favorite, a favorite of theirs. Um, skunks are generally attracted to food sources. So feeding pets outside, uh, having gardens with lots of vegetables, bird feeders, certainly apple trees, all of those things will attract skunks. Once you have them, uh, the, the way to determine uh, uh, skunk encroachment is by uh, that of uh, digging uh, about a six inch hole, either under steps or under sheds. Uh, skunks can be readily live trapped and moved off a of property. You have to take them a long ways away. Uh, otherwise they will be back. They'll cover uh, um, a lot of ground when uh, uh, they have, uh, particularly if they have young ones, a uh, female uh, skunk will go 50 kilometers to get back to her den. So again, uh, there's a lot of information uh, about trapping skunks, uh, but this is something that I would leave to a professional. Uh, those who know what they're doing can uh, deal with skunks very quickly and uh, cost effectively. Um, skunks, again, uh, are prone to uh, viral uh, infection uh, and also uh, spraying. So if you have a dog uh, in your yard, uh, um, the female skunk, particularly if she has young ones, will be spraying nonstop. So um, not an animal you want hanging around. Control of garbage is one of the main ways that you can reduce exposure to skunks. Um, <clears throat> deer. Uh, deer, we see them common now, almost in and around uh, a lot of uh, towns and cities, certainly in rural acreages. The best uh, 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 protection against uh, deer encroachment uh, and having them feeding on gardens and ornamental trees is fencing. A good fence, uh, a high fence, right to the limit of what you're allowed in a city, uh, is an excellent deterrent for deer. If you're in uh, in a rural uh, area and you're having a, a uh, and you live in a subdivision or an acreage, one of the most effective ways to keep deer out of yards is to use what's called intercept feeding, whereby uh, uh, yourself or neighbors uh, uh, chip in. And buy a, 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 a couple of round bales of green feed or second cut alfalfa and place them out and away from uh, people's uh, property. And uh, it will uh, intercept the deer on their way into the property. Believe me, they will stick with uh, second cut alfalfa or green feed and be less likely uh, to want to jump fences into backyards uh, in order to uh, uh, feed on ornamental trees and shrubs. Remember again, if you have apple trees or other fruit bearing trees um, and uh, grasses, mowing the lawn down, keeping it short and removing any uh, uh, rotting berries and vegetation off of the ground uh, will reduce uh, your exposure to deer, uh, significantly both meal deer and whitetails. Okay, and I'll get to our next slide here. Uh, moose. Moose is just a bigger problem um, in and around mostly acreages, uh, but they can also find their way uh, to uh, uh, residential properties on, on the uh, edge of towns. Number one thing about moose, uh, they're a very large animal. They need to be respected. They're not pets. They're wild, and they can be dangerous, um, particularly in uh, calving season, uh, beginning in uh, May and June, when cow moose have young calves with them. They can be extremely predictable and uh, aggressive. 
um, in the fall, in September and October. Bull moose, uh, when they're in the rut at that time of year, can be also very aggressive and unpredictable. Do not challenge them. Do not try to scare them. Uh, if you have uh, moose on your property, that might be a perceived threat. You should phone Fish and Wildlife Division to deal with it. In terms of uh, preventative uh, uh, encounters with mo moose and uh, uh, resulting damages, <clears throat> very best protection, again, is a good high strong fence. Uh, just a barbed wire fence is not a deterrent at all to moose or deer. Uh, but a strong, uh, either, you know, high, six feet or better, page wire, but preferably wood fence. Um, and that will deter uh, moose encroachment into uh, acreages and residential areas. Um, and again, um, now for acreage areas, uh, one thing you might also want to look at for large animals like moose is electric fencing. And uh, those fences can be quite effective uh, for ungulates and predators. And uh, that information is readily available on the internet to uh, the uh, Center for uh, Damage Control that I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are suppliers of electric fencing in Alberta. Uh, so that's, uh, if you're having a bad problem uh, with a deer or moose, you might want to consider that as an option. Okay, uh, we have about uh, nine minutes uh, left. Are we down to our last slide there? I think, I think just about. We, are, we are, Bill, but um, yep. so we can uh, turn it over. We have a couple questions that kind of remain sure. unanswered. So if we can maybe go into those, I don't see any new ones Let's in, do the that. Q you betcha. in the Q&A box. Okay, so the first one is, what are some methods of deterring rabbits from eating plants? So rabbits. Okay. Well, if you have, uh, um, whether it is wild hares like snowshoe hares or jackrabbits or cottontail rabbits or uh, feral uh, domestic rabbits, the issue is the same. The best deterrent and all the commercial stuff that they sell in the stores, uh, you know, the chemical stuff and all of that, all of that is a waste of time. It's not effective at all. Um, if you even if uh, your front lawn is an attraction to rabbits and it's tough to de to uh, deter them off that but uh any kind of uh even a decorative but strong fence that's uh even a, a couple of feet high will actually be a deterrent to ornamental and garden areas uh rabbit rabbits don't jump that high and so if you uh, uh, keep uh, the uh, gaps uh, in that uh, ornamental fencing uh, uh, two inches or under, you're going to keep most, uh, exclude most rabbits from getting into gardens and uh, around ornamental shrubs and that. Um, that's about the only deterrent uh, that uh, I've ever seen work, exclusion. Uh, again, for a lot of pest species, particularly rodents, is one of the best deterrents that we have. And uh, it, uh, fencing uh, is one of our, our best options there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so just another question around, like, if you are looking to relocate or tra live trap squirrels, um, how far do you have to take them in order for them to not return? <laughs> The best thing you can do is take them across a water body, like a, a minimum uh, uh, the size of the Sturgeon River. Uh, but the North Saskatchewan is a great is a great barrier for returning squirrels. Um, remember this though: uh, if you're going to live trap and uh, uh, and relocate a squirrel. Doing it after the beginning of August is pretty much a death sentence for them because they will not have time to gather wherever you take them. Remember, they're now in the territory of other squirrels. 
So they're going to be victimized anyway. Uh, the chances of a, even a squirrel who are quite adept at surviving a relocation is about 50-50 because they'll, wherever you take them, they'll likely get pushed out by other squirrels. Um, but uh, if you still want to do that, uh, make sure you do it uh, before August because once August rolls around, they no longer have time to collect enough food for the winter and you're condemning uh, uh, that squirrel to uh, death by starvation. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you're after uh, the beginning, very, very latest, mid-August, uh, um, uh, humane lethal control is a much better option uh, than live capture and relocation. Perfect. And then one last question in terms of uh, decoys. So sometimes you see people who use like plastic decoys that look like an owl or anything like that. Have you ever seen any success for certain species? And do you have any comments to provide? The other thing is sound machines, like outdoor music and sound machines, if you can speak to those two things. Yeah. Uh, so deterrence like that will work, but only in combination. Um, uh, plastic owls and stuff like that uh, on their own will not work and you should just save your money. Uh, if you're going to use a noise deterrent that uh, emulates uh, the noises of predatory birds or animals in order to uh, uh, scare um, uh, pest animals away, they can be effective, but it's expensive. Uh, you, you have to have uh, something that uh, has a chip in it that is going to vary uh, the uh, type of uh, predator or scare call that's being used. Otherwise, uh, pest uh, birds or uh, animals will habituate to it very, very quickly. So uh, visual deterrence in combine, combined with a high quality uh, uh, noise deterrent can be effective. Oh, perfect. We do have one in the in the chat. So um, can you talk about how people can prevent muskrats from habitating uh, ponds or water bodies? Yes, I can. Well, the best defense uh, uh, against muskrats is the use is the is uh, the use of what we call a riffraff barrier, which means um, uh, one inch uh, galvanized uh, wire or heavy, heavy fiberglass cloth. And it has to be uh, the heavy uh, construction grade cloth uh, uh, or the rats will go right through it. But it needs to be covered with, with, uh, with uh, jagged riffraff rock. And that rock has to extend below the waterline uh, at least a couple of feet. And so the time to do that is uh, either in the construction phase or to drain the pond down, do that work, and then uh, uh, fill the pond up again. And if that is done, uh, you will deter muskrat habitation. Um, but uh, uh, it, it has to be a combination of the uh, underlay and then the uh, riffraff um, crushed uh, two inch stone on top of that uh, underlay. And then you will have a have a good barrier. Also, uh, uh, removing uh, cattails will also deter muskrat habitation because they do depend on them for winter food supply. And got anything oh. else? Got one minute um. left. So I think that that concludes all the questions. Um, so yeah, I think we'll just uh, close off. So uh, thank you everybody for attending and uh, thank you Bill for presenting today. Um, I do know you had mentioned um, if people wanted, if they had questions or anything, um, you can definitely um, reach out to Bill um, or your municipality. Um, depending on every municipality has a little bit of a different service kind of around problem wildlife on municipal lands. So um, 
If you ever have any questions there, they can be a good first point of contact or as Bill mentioned, their uh, professional wildlife um, uh, service providers uh, are also a, a good resource that's available to you. So um, yeah, so thank you everyone for attending and um, we will close off for the evening. Have a good night. Awesome, thanks very much. Thank you, Bill.